Hello everyone, and welcome to the first part of our CCNA training. I recorded this video originally, and uh, I looked back and I saw that I was using a lot of filler words, and I was going fairly quickly over the material. At times, I believe I was hard to understand. As a result, I am re-recording these first three sessions, hopefully for your benefit. I'd like to reach out to everyone who has not had a chance to attend the in-class sessions. I look forward to hopefully seeing you in some future sessions. Uh, today we're going to talk about introduction uh, just to what the CCNA is and also the networking models that we'll be using to hopefully refer to some of these concepts as we go through the course. So let's take a look. First I'd like you to have an idea of what the big picture is for the CCNA exam. Our goal in the big picture is to allow communication between electronic devices. This is the end all be all of networking. History, in this case, has determined a lot of today's technology, so as a result, I'll be going over some of the historical uh, facts about, for example, Ethernet, and hopefully uh, this will help give you an insight as to why Ethernet works, in this particular example, the way it does today. The idea is that a lot of times technologies have not been improved since their original state, and so by looking at their past states, we can get an idea of how technology works today and why it works the way it works. Networking has several recurring problems that I'll be discussing on the next side. I'd like for you to, at any point, if you see some of these recurring problems, take a note, and um, a lot of times seeing these problems will help, uh, help you remember some of the concepts we cover, because the majority of these protocols, these ideas, these networking models and so forth are about solving the problems that networking presents. And we'll, like I said, go through some of those in the next slide. The CCNA tends to focus on two particular types of networks. In this case, uh, we're looking at enterprise networks and also small office or home office or what we call SOHO networks. Unfortunately, service provider networks are outside the scope of the CCNA, but uh, we may end up dealing with a little bit of that configuration just kind of as an aside. You, don't, you are not required to know these concepts for the CCNA exam. Some of the recurring problems in networking that I mentioned, um, I've just listed a few here. You, I encourage you as you think of some more to go through and uh, note these down, like I said. It'll help you remember a lot of the concepts we cover. So the first one would be how data can get from one machine to another. It could be via fiber, it could be wireless, it could be copper, any of these are okay. Um, and we'll go over some more examples of this as well. Another problem, how does one machine address another machine? So how can we refer to machines uh, individually in the short term? Another problem would be how we can divide a network into parts that make sense. So say we have an amalgamation of machines, how can we logically divide the network into portions that make it easier to refer to you know, individual devices. Finally, we want to look at how information gets between these networks. Um, and then these four questions provide the biggest scope for the CCNA exam. And so as we go through the exam, these are the four questions you should keep in mind. Um, and these are the four questions that we'll try to answer gradually over the next uh, seven weeks or so. Obviously, you'll find some questions on your own. Again, write these down as you see them. They'll help you remember the networking concepts more than just rote memorization, and will actually help you a lot more in the long term. So we try to simplify a lot of these networking problems by creating these models. Basically, we want to break these problems into manageable pieces. And the old saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? Well, we eat it one bite at a time. In this case, the idea is that we want to divide these you know, big problems, for example, addressing into what we call, in the terms of these models, layers. That is, we want to divide them into smaller pieces that are related to the individual aspects of each problem. Again, these networking models place each problem, each set of problems into layers, and we'll be looking at some examples of these models. The two models that the CCNA is concerned with are is the Open Systems Interconnect model, the OSI model, and the TCP IP model, which is used in most modern computing systems today. Of the two, I believe the TCP IP model is the more practical. Now let's look at some of the models uh, physically, uh, first I guess in a diagram. And then we'll go through the actual layers and look at what each of these layers represent. 
I wanted to give you guys kind of an overview of how these two models overlap, and I would encourage you, after going through and studying mo these models, to look back at this diagram to get a better idea of what the OSI and TCP IP models are trying to tell you, what they're trying to get at in their innermost sense. Again, your goal here is not rote memorization, but to have an innate understanding of why these models are divided the way they're divided. And so if you look at the OSI model on the left, we have all of these seven layers, physical, data link, network, all the way up to application. The OSI model, to me, is the more divisive of the two models, and that it breaks problems down into smaller individual parts. For example, you'll notice uh, the application layer in the TCP IP model actually spans three layers of the OSI model. To me, of these two models, again, the TCP IP model seems to be the more practical, the more applied, and the more you know easy to refer to model. And so as we look through these, I'll probably tend to favor TCP IDP descriptions over OSI, where most textbooks will actually favor OSI. So we're going to look at the TCP IP model first. Now, this model, like I said, is one of my favorites, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. I'm going to try to give you a, big, a brief overview. This model was originally called, uh, is actually called, the Internet Protocol Suite. This uh, model was developed in, for the U.S. Department of Defense for ARPANET, that is the precursor to our modern Internet. And this model uh, has kind of taken off as com the computing world has exploded and other companies and systems start adopting the original the ARPANET technologies. This is, as I mentioned, the simplest model. It has four layers. We start out with the link layer. Uh, this is also sometimes known as the network access layer. Basically, we're worried about local network communication. That is, how local devices can access the network. The primary example of this today would be Ethernet. Um, Ethernet is primarily concerned with just being able to access local devices and talk to them. Next, we have what we refer to as the Internet layer. This layer allows us to communicate between two networks, or two or more networks in some cases. The idea behind this layer is to logically divide you know, each of these individual local connections into several global connections and to be able to route between them accordingly. We'll be talking more about the Internet layer in weeks you know, 4, 5, and 6 later on in these presentations. Finally, we have the transport layer, which connects individual hosts, and then we have the application layer that connects between applications. The examples I've given for these last three layers, uh, IPs used very, very commonly as an internet layer. You guys were probably familiar with the basic mechanisms of IP. We'll be elaborating more of those, like I said, later on. Uh, transport layer, the example I give is Transmission Control Protocol, TCP. Uh, there's also UDP, which you may be familiar with. Again, we'll discuss a little bit more about these as we uh, encounter them. And finally, we have the application layer. Many of you will probably know several different applications that run on Ethernet slash IP slash TCP. Um, the example I've given here is HTTP. Uh, some of you also may be aware of like Telnet or SSH or File Transfer Protocol, FTP, and there are a number of others. So just keep in mind, these are the different layers. Of the two models, as I mentioned, the TCP IP model is more realistic. It is also much less specific in the way it defines uh, layers. For example, link layer is simply concerned with local access. It does not specify how this happens or you know, to what degree this happens or what local access actually means. Um, whereas the internet layer is concerned with merging two local access networks. Now, what do we do? What does that exactly mean? There are lots of different ways of implementing these problems. And IP is just one of several different ways. So TCP IP doesn't really define the exact problems, but it provides a good way for us to divide the actual physical protocols of the internet today, which is why I like to refer to things by their TCP IP model names. The OSI model has, as I mentioned, seven layers. Um, and I'll go through them briefly here. I have a slide dedicated to each one. So layer one is concerned with the physical connection, that is the actual cables, pinouts, voltages, and so forth. Layer two is concerned with data leak connectivity, that is actually establishing host-to-host -host connectivity, not just physically, but in terms of virtual bits and how they are addressed. Layer three, much like the uh, second layer of the TCP IP model, is concerned with networks. Uh, so we're dividing these data link connections into networks, basically logically dividing them and then uh, finding paths between them. That is what layer three is concerned with. Layer four is concerned with transport. So we want to make sure data gets from one end to the other successfully, and we want to be able to basically manipulate the flow of data from one host to another. Layer five is concerned with sessions. So layer five is mostly concerned with authentication, permissions, stuff like this. 
Layer 6 is concerned with presentation, and it is at this layer that we actually go from abstract binary data to something that actually means something. Finally, we have Layer 7, which is the application that interfaces between the user and the rest of these layers. Again, the, the OSI model has more divisions that separates the tasks between layers a little bit better and kind of more clearly outlines the different functions that we see in networking. This is seldom very realistic, and I'll give you some examples of this after we discuss each of these layers. Layer 1. The OSI model uh, Layer 1 is concerned basically with, like I said, transmission medium, pinouts, voltages, all these sorts of physical requirements that the, ne that the network relies on. Hubs operate at layer 1, so whenever you see a hub, you should think of it as a layer 1 device. That is a device that physically connects devices, but doesn't really do anything else. Um, some examples of layer 1 technology that I've seen in the past and that you may have also seen, uh, V.92, that is modems that were used to connect devices, USB, Ethernet, DSL, Bluetooth. I'm sure you could also think of a few wireless standards, for example, 802.11, uh, A, B, G, N, and now AC is the latest standard. Layer 2 of the OSI model is concerned with going from a physical connection to a meaningful data connection. This is called the data link layer, and so we provide error detection and node-to-node -node communication. I have detection italicized here because I wanted to distinguish very highly between error detection and error correction, whereas error detection simply detects whether an error has occurred and discards frames accordingly. Error correction actually tries to fix errors, tries to go back and if necessary perhaps retransmit or correct a frame to ensure proper data transmission. Uh, the CCNA exam is very, very picky about how these terms are defined, and so as you're reading questions, be sure to read very carefully when error correction or error detection are mentioned as to which one applies. Switches operate at layer 2, so whenever you think of a switch, you could think of a layer 2 device. Again, switches think a little bit more than hubs, whereas hubs are simply physical devices that repeat connections. Hubs actually look into the layer 2 properties and try to, you know, route frames accordingly. Route is probably the right word. Switch is the correct word, obviously, with switches. But basically try to make frames go where they should go in a more efficient manner than a hub which simply repeats frames. There are two sublayers to this uh, layer. The first one is the media access control layer, which is cons which basically uh, specifies how a node can access the network and when it accesses the network. So um, we'll look, talk about this more when we talk about collisions. The second one is the logical link control layer, which controls how links are how nodes are organized and um, how nodes are addressed. So uh, MAC addressing would be an example of this. Some examples of these different uh, layer two protocols we have ARP which is used to resolve Ethernet addresses to IP addresses. We have Ethernet as a method of, method of access. I mentioned MAC addresses previously. Frame Relay is a WAN connectivity that we'll be talking about, as well as point-to-point -point and token ring. Uh, token ring we will not be discussing in the uh, context of the CCNA exam. The CCNA does not require much knowledge of token ring, so we won't really be talking about it. Um, but you should be aware that it's out there, and if you're curious, I'd suggest that you study it on your own time. I highly recommend it. Even though you may not see this technology in today's framework, you'll see it in a lot of legacy systems, and it was used very widely in manufacturing. So look into it on your own time and uh, definitely check it out. The layer 3 of the OSI model is basically concerned with transferring data between two networks. So now that we've established a system of nodes, we want to be able to get from one set of nodes to another. Routers operate at layer 3. That is to say, routers are concerned with dividing networks into logical pieces. So whenever I think of, whenever I say a router, or mention a router, or show a router on a diagram, you should be thinking that this is a layer 3 device. So to recap, routers operate at layer 3, switches operate at layer 2, and hubs operate at layer 1. So uh, each of these devices maps sort of to the respective layers, and you can think about these devices in terms of the layers of the OSI model. Layer 3, as I mentioned, is concerned with logical addressing. So as a networking engineer, it is your job to make a network that makes sense. That is, it is your job to design and design a network correctly, not just in the only manner that it could be designed or in one of the many manners that it could be designed, but in the best possible method as you see fit. And there are large, large volumes about how to do this. The Cisco design exam, uh, the Cisco design expert, I can't think of the uh, certification off the top of my head. 
but the Cisco Design uh, Expert Certification is one of the most highly prized uh, certifications out there because network design is such a broad, vast, all-encompassing topic. And so, as a network engineer, we really have our work cut out for us. But the whole point of Layer 3 is to make this a little bit easier by dividing it into logical pieces that make sense to the network engineer. And so, a good network engineer will divide his pieces, you know, to basically suit the circumstances. And we'll be talking a lot more about Layer 3 networking design when we talk about Layer 3 protocols and how they can be divided. And you'll actually be spending most the majority of your exam and the majority of your time studying Layer 3 protocols. Some examples that I've listed here include Internet Protocol, um, Internet Control Message Protocol, which some of you guys may have used. If you've ever used the ping command, you've used an ICMP uh, command. Internetwork Packet Exchange, which is used by Apple devices. We don't really talk about that in the CCNA exam. And finally, Routing Information Protocol, which provides network information between routers. We will be talking about RIP uh, towards the uh, second part of this, uh, these modules. So layer 4 of the OSI model is concerned primarily with reliability, flow control, and error correction. Again, I'm going to contrast this term with error detection. While it's layer 2's job to determine whether or not a packet is good, it's layer 4's job to account for that and to try to maybe fix the issue. Or, you know, ask for a retransmission, as is the case most of the time. Layer 4 allows hosts to interpret connections as a data stream, and actually, it turns out layer 4 is the last layer of the OSI model where we can look at connections in terms of a network. You'll notice that the TCP IP model, if you go back to that diagram on your own time, combines layers, the upper layers, layers 5, 6, and 7, into one layer and that calls it the application layer. And in most operating systems, this is how it is viewed. Um, networking drivers and networking stacks tend to take care of the layer 4, layer 3, layer 2, and layer 1. Um, devices. Layer 1 is usually taken care of by drivers. And so Layer 4 is what I would refer to as the last actual networking layer in terms of the OSI model. Some examples of Layer 4 protocols include Transmission Control Protocol and Universal Datagram Protocol, TCP and UDP, which you've probably heard of before. Reliable Datagram Protocol and Datagram Congestion Control Protocol are also examples. We'll actually talk about DCCP once we hit Frame Relay. Layer 5 of the OSI model, and again, this is where we start getting into more application stuff, so stuff that's typically handled by applications. Um, but Layer 5 is concerned with how connections are established. And so typically, encryption occurs at this layer, um, and normally sessions information, so login, um, password, stuff like that. Some examples of Layer 5 protocols, we have Session Control Protocol, Socket Secure, uh, known as SOX, you've probably used a SOX proxy at some point, Point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, this was uh, one of the early types of VPN, uh, but would be considered a layer 5 protocol because it doesn't really encrypt so much as it just establishes a connection. And H.245 is used for uh, multimedia communication, so audio and video streams over IP. Layer 6 of the OSI model is concerned with taking data that is, you know, raw binary input and then actually making it make sense to the end user. So this is concerned with data interpretation to the user. And basically, at this point, at layer 6, we're going from network datagrams, that is, individual pieces that have flown over a wire, uh, to something that makes sense to the user, to something that's usable by the operating system and eventually the user. So there are two sublayers to this, actually. One takes the binary bits and assembles them into something that means something to the computer, the operating system. And the second one goes from something that's usable by the operating system to something that's usable by the end user. So we call these different elements common application servant element, that's case, and then specific application servant elements, that's SACE. Some examples uh, that you may be familiar with, ASCII, which would be considered a case level. Um, ASCII basically takes binary values and converts them to characters. And so by looking at a raw binary string, we can extrapolate a series of characters. This is used very commonly in today's operating systems, or some you know form of that. The other two examples, PNG and JPEG, are a little bit of both. Normally there's an element that interprets the binary data and sections it out into terms of, like in this case, pixels. And uh, finally, they will interpret each of these pixels and display them to the user on a monitor uh, for viewing. And so PNG and JPEG are the, other, the two other examples of layer 6. Finally, we arrive at layer 7. This would be the application layer. And so we're talking about actual interaction with the user. So we're trying to basically interface all of this lower level stuff to the user in a way that makes sense. Layer 7 is responsible for process-to-process -pro 
process-to-process -process communication. This doesn't just mean between two network nodes, but even on the same machine, two processes can communicate through these OSI model and all of these lower le networking layers. Um, normally, this is done through what's called a loopback interface. Examples of this, um, Telnet, which you've probably worked with before, HTTP, which I'm sh almost completely sure all of you have seen, uh, file transfer protocol, and domain name system. I'm pretty sure everybody's relied on DNS at some point or other. So now we get to narrow the focus of uh, this sort of uh, amalgamation of stuff that we have. So uh, the CCNA and network engineering in general, when you're talking about uh, designing and implementing networks, is primarily concerned with layers two and three. So layer two, we want to establish connectivity between two devices on a local segment. And layer three, we want to be able to organize multiple local segments and route between them. Um, this is the job of network engineers. You'll basically need an understanding of all the surrounding layers as well. You may not need to know exact details, or you know, in the case of some of the CCIE guys, they may actually have to know quite a few details about this. Um, so you will need to know for your CCNA exam how Ethernet, Ethernet is pinned out and a few of the different wireless standards. Um, you'll also need to know something about TCP services and contrast it with UDP, and also be able to give some uh, port numbers of common services that rely on these lower level protocols. Again, uh, the layers of the OSI model provide useful distinctions, and the OSI is a really good example of dividing this problem into some meaningful parts. However, um, I favor the TCP IP model for this reason. They're not exceptionally realistic. Um, for example, Ethernet uh, doesn't just concern the type of cabling you use, but also the way the data is uh, transferred from one device to another. And so Ethernet kind of merges these two technologies, these two layers, into a single layer. And again, go back to that diagram and take a look at the diagram. I believe it doesn't even map layer one to the Ethernet layer because Ethernet itself does not necessarily define a cabling type. Um, in fact, there were several types of Ethernet. We'll talk about that in the next presentation. Um, another example, uh, HTTP does not provide uh, for independent layers. It doesn't just handle the application, it actually handles session initiation uh, and termination as well. And so we have two layers here that are being handled by HTTP. There are also some uh, services that occur on more than one layer. Uh, encryption is the primary example of this. For example, um, you know, security facilities may use hardware encryption uh, to secure uh, basically to ensure that nobody is eavesdropping. They may also use actual internal data encryption, for example, on layers 2, 3, or 4, to prevent eavesdropping on these other layers as well. And encryption can occur in a number of places. Again, typically layer 5, or sometimes it depends on the uh, book that you read, layer 6, are used for encryption. And so now we have to go back and look at how these layers interact, how they basically come together to form this entire networking model. Now, it's very hard to get a continuous, reliable, 100% secure transmission of a continuous data stream from one computer to another. And so the easiest way they that was, this was handled in the early days uh, was to divide this into chunks, uh, what we call sometimes packets, but it's actually a little bit more specific than that. So um, here's an example of what we would call a frame. Um, and on this frame is comprised, as you can see, of data from the application layer. Now, this data is actually given a UDP header in this case. Uh, this could also be a TCP header. And so by applying this UDP or TCP header, what we're doing is we're saying this is what port, this is what application or possibly, you know, service I'm using to communicate. After we do that, we specify an IP header. That is, we basically specify what part, logical part of the uh, internet working scheme we're in. Um, typically, this is done after the UDP header. And finally, once we actually have to transmit something over the wire, we need to transmit it to some device on the local network. So we add a frame header and a frame footer, basically forming a frame. And you'll notice that this frame incorporates all of the previous elements, including the IP header, the UDP header, and any data within from the application layer of the TCP IP model. This process is called encapsulation, placing one layer into another layer into another layer. So now we get to some vocabulary associated with this encapsulation. Obviously, we don't want to just refer to all of this as just a packet, or all of this as just a frame. And so we have some meaningful distinctions that I want you guys to keep in mind as we talk about this. So at layer two, we call these individual units frames. A frame refers to 
basically the uh, frame header, the Ethernet header and trailer, and all of the data incorporated within that. So the bottom of that previous diagram would be a frame. Moving up from there on the inside of a frame is what we would call a packet. Again, uh, the packet is going to incorporate the IP header and all of the data associated with that IP header. So that would be the second layer up from the bottom on the previous uh, slide. Finally, we look at layer 4. Layer 4 we consider to be a datagram. You actually don't hear this term thrown out very often. Uh, but a layer 4 we call it a datagram, and that consists of the port information and the data associated with that port information. Typically, people tend to use the word packet for any and or all of these. Um, but again, I like for you guys as you go through your exams and talking to each other to keep these distinctions in mind. And so when we talk about switching, typically we shouldn't be talking about packets because switches are layer 2 device, right? So we will talk about frames. When you talk about routers, talking about packets makes sense. Now when you're talking about inter-machine communication, it may, be, uh, may make a little bit more sense to be talking about datagrams. So just keep these in mind. Again, uh, I encourage you, go back, look at the previous slide, and try to figure out which one of these is the innermost and outermost in terms of encapsulation. The outermost being the one that's on the outside, um, and the innermost being the one that's on the inside are the most buried under all of those other layers. So take a look at that. Try to be able to answer this question on your own. I hope you guys enjoy this very first video. Again, I tried to re-record this and perhaps proceed a little bit more slowly so that I'm hopefully a little bit more understandable. Um, I also made some audio tweaks, so hopefully you can actually understand what I'm saying this time. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I encourage you to comment or like this video, and um, I hope to see you guys in class. I'm going to go ahead and record the next presentation.